Good afternoon. Thank you for tuning into today's event, Strategies for Chinese Companies to Navigate the U.S. Media Landscape, the first session of the CGCC PR and Marketing Training Series. If you're not familiar with CGCC, we are an independent, nonpartisan, non-government chamber of commerce with a mission to create value, generate economic growth, and enhance cooperation between the U.S. and Chinese business communities. We provide a broad range of programs, services, and resources to over a thousand multinational corporate members. My name is Abby Lee. I'm your host today. And on behalf of CGCC, I would like to express my warmest welcome and appreciation to everyone attending today's webinar. This webinar aims to provide member companies with a better understanding of the importance of public relations under the current U.S. media landscape and advises Chinese companies on crisis and risk management. We're very excited to have Prozac partners with us today to share their experience in the area of PR and marketing. Established in 1990, Prozac Partners is among the largest independent PR and communication firms in the U.S. and one of the few domestic mid-sized firms that offers global capabilities through its London office and international network. Prozac specializes in the financial and professional services sectors, working to build, strengthen, and protect the world's top brands. Today, we're delighted to have Prozac Managing Director Tom Brasicki with us to lead our presentation. With more than 20 years of experience in financial communications, investor relations, advising clients on a variety of specific situations, including M&A, IPO, and other corporate activities, he will provide insights and, uh, and guidance on how to successfully navigate the U.S. media landscape and provide recommendations on successful PR tactics for Chinese companies operating in the U.S. Well, before we start, there are uh, a few housekeeping rules. Today's event will be recorded and live streamed on CGCC's LinkedIn page. The video recording will be made available on the CGCC YouTube channel, website, and social media post event. While today's comments are on the record, the views and opinions expressed by our guests are not uh, uh, are there are theirs alone and do not necessarily represent the official views or positions of the institutions they work for. If you have any questions during the course of the webinar, you are more than welcome to bring them up using the Q&A box located on the bottom of your screen. Our speakers will try their best to address them during the Q&A session. Well, now, without further ado, let's welcome Tom Brasicki. Tom, it's all yours. Thank you, Abby, so much for that warm welcome. And thank you to the CGCC for inviting me today. I'm really looking forward to this session um, and to sharing some of our insights with all of you as we navigate what can only be described as a very dynamic uh, media and public relations market. Um, I'd like to start off by talking a little bit about what PR actually is. We hear that phrase so often, what is public relations? And I thought it might be worthwhile to spend a little bit of time talking about uh, exactly what that means. And on the next slide, we kind of really get down to it. At the end of the day, it really is managing the flow of information between your organization and your publics. And your public can be a lot of different things, many different constituencies. It's the folks that you want to use your products and services. It's the folks that are already using your products and services. It's the employees within your four walls who are helping you to create those opportunities to interface with those audiences. But ultimately, what we're looking to do is connect those messages to outside third-party outlets, the newspapers, television, magazines, and more and more the internet channels that we use so often on a daily basis. Providing facts and a legitimacy to your organization through those channels to raise the profile of your independent organizations. On the next slide, talk a lot about what the benefits are, right? This idea that if I'm gonna spend the time and in many cases, the money to do this, what are the net benefits? Well, directly informing stakeholders about where you sit in the, in the market landscape is incredibly important. And you'll hear me reference this many times. In the absence of information in the, the marketplace about your, your company, somebody will fill it for you. And so PR really gives you the opportunity to directly inform your stakeholders about what you're doing in good times and in bad. And we'll talk a little bit about crisis management later on. And it also allows you to position yourself as a, as a leader in the markets that you serve. The more you can be part of the broader conversations 
not just about the products and services that you're offering, but about the general market dynamic, the more you can be viewed as a leader in the space. Keeping your brand fresh, reminding folks who haven't come inside the tent and those that are already using your products and services about your brand. And then finally, developing relationships. I think what it really comes down to is we look at this uh, PR effort as an opportunity to build enduring relationships with our stakeholders by building enduring relationships with the press. And we counsel our clients all the time not to look at each individual interview opportunity or television appearance or blog post as a single point of contact with those audiences, but a continuing conversation with your audiences, which you reinforce through those channels on any given day. Moving on, why do we use PR? Well, I kid on some of these things, but I'll highlight a few in this slide. It's telling your story. You know, it's not just about giving the, the nature of the benefits of your product and service or telling everybody what you do as a company. It's really being able to give the narrative behind why you exist. What value are you putting inside of the value chain? And how can you be a constant and frequent commentator about the state of the market? Getting those key messages out there to make sure that everybody is really speaking from the same playbook. Um, and that anybody who touches these external audiences is reinforcing those three or four key messages that really define your organization, but also to bring forth that differentiation. Number three, those key messages should highlight why you are different from your competitors and how you're breaking to, looking to break new ground in your segment. Trust, you'll hear me speak about this a lot today. Uh, again, in the absence of your explanation for why things are happening, folks will assume that either you're not interested in telling them why, or they'll think that something nefarious is going on. The ability to build trust and goodwill with these audiences by owning the narrative is so crucial as we move through the cycle. And by the way, building up that trust in advance helps with number five, combating the negative press that invariably comes. I'd like to tell you that this is all sunshine and rainbows, but we will experience those times when the press isn't so favorable. And I can tell you if your first interface with the press is to combat negativity, you will not have as good a road as if you had previously built up some good will with those audiences. Finally, transparency. The ability to talk about what you're going to do now and where you're going to do it in the future to elicit that call to action. I think sometimes we view our interface with the media as just a something we need to do, a box to be checked, but I look at it quite differently. I believe that each time we have the opportunity to interface with the media, we are creating an excuse for those audience to interface with our brands more deeply. And again, we need to ring that bell. We need to bring them in. They will not come there volitionally because when you're not out there talking to the press, I can assure you that your competitors are. So that call to action is so incredibly important. And it's, again, not always just talking about the good things that are going on. There's a difference between offensive and defensive PR. And on most days, it can be pretty black and white. You're either trying to build and grow or you're trying to protect and fix. And I think we all know what those two modes are. When the press is good, it's about how you're affecting the marketplace in a positive way, how your brand is adding value, how you're bringing more people onto your platform. Uh, when you're protecting and fix, perhaps the news is not so good. You need to be out there managing that reputation. And again, when we think about the core tenets of PR, it's to promote, but it's also to protect. And sometimes we are a little bit on the defensive. I'll talk a little bit more about issues management and why that's so important in a moment. But you can see on the balance of this slide, really some of the eight things that are so incredibly important to make sure that you're getting out there on a proactive basis in order to build and grow and so that you have stable ground to protect and fix. The messaging and the corporate narrative, so incredibly important. What do you stand for? What do you mean to the marketplace? That brand development, what is that logo? What does that brand stand for? And how do you bring that forth? Interfacing with the media, of course, but buttressing that with thought leadership and executive visibility, it's not enough just to appear in the press. You need to reinforce that with points of view through your executive suite to constantly reinforce those brand and corporate narratives. Social amplification, and digital media, I'll talk a little bit more about the intersection of those things in a moment, but man, if you're not participating in digital media, then it's safe to say you're currently being left behind. We've seen retail and more consumer facing organizations lead the way, but for our more institutional members of the audience today, whether you be in financial services or other regulated industries, the time is now to engage in digital and social and paid functionality because it is more and more where the media is getting their ideas and where your publics are interfacing with you. Many of us are in regulated industry. So how are we responding to changes in the marketplace from a regulatory or litig litigation perspective? Now, I know it's custom for us not to comment on pending litigation 
against our firms. And I would advise anybody on this call never to comment on a pending corporate action. However, there are larger issues at play. If we do see a spate of new regulations or new litigations that are coming through our channels, is it time for us to make a comment? Is it time for us to understand or to express how we would handle a similar situation to reinforce to our audiences that we understand what the stakes are and that we're there for their protection? Designing creative services. I bring this up only because in the old times, five or 10 years ago, we didn't care too much about how these messages were reaching our audiences. When I speak of designing creative services, I'm talking about the packaging around our messages, infographics, how we pre present video on LinkedIn or other channels. These sorts of paradigms are becoming the norm. No longer is it enough just for us to publish the written word and expect that our audiences will be able to interface with them and understand them. Now more than ever, we need to bring some style and some creativity to the way we create these messages. It's the only way we can get these audiences to engage. Video is becoming the new normal um, and print is somehow taking a back seat. And finally, on the bad days, management turnover or scandal. Sometimes the news is not so good, but I can assure you if you've spent time on the first seven parts of the slide, building up that goodwill with the marketplace and helping them to understand that you have a point of view, then you have solid ground to stand on as you talk about changes in your organization or perhaps some bad news that does hit the wire. It's easier for you to respond to bad news when you've already built a treasure trove of goodwill with your publics. You know, the delineation between PR and marketing is sometimes very, very blurred, but I think it's very easy to delineate at the end of the day. I think the reputation management is what public relations is all about, both for better or for worse. This idea about how we actively manage our reputation as a firm, how we bring forth good thoughts and ideas around the products and services that we're providing, that's really the job of public relations. Marketing is really promoting our specific services. There is a need for our services in the marketplace, and we want our customers and our potential customers to engage with us there. These two things work in lockstep. A few years back, you would be able to isolate public relations from marketing. That's no longer possible. And in fact, I would argue that public relations, marketing, and for our publicly traded friends on the call today, investor relations, all work with each other to promulgate that good view of the company. How we are minding our own store and our balance sheet reflects very much about our, our reputation from a company perspective, and also how we market our goods and services. True partnership between those three parts of the triangle are really necessary in today's day and age to make sure that we're getting out in front of and owning our own narrative. To be reactive in any of these modes can be very problematic as we move through the cycle. And what tools do we use in PR? Bringing it back to that lens. You may have heard this phrase before that there are three three legs to this stool. They are earned, paid, and owned. And this is largely true. There are gray areas. You see the overlap in the, in the Venn diagram. But ultimately, what earned media is, is probably what we're most familiar with in PR. It's the media relations piece. It's the sharing of information through clearly defined channels, whether they be digital or traditional, but our, us telling our story us being able to share what we do with the marketplace. The paid media piece is advertising and advertising takes many forms. It's no longer just banner ads or television commercials, it's pay-per-click. It's using new digital channels such as LinkedIn to amplify our content, paying through to get people to pay attention to what we're talking about. And I can go into that more detail later on. And then finally, the owned media, which is the things that we own that reinforce that brand message, our website, our blogs, the social media that we're putting out there every day, whether it be Twitter or LinkedIn or other types of platforms. But ultimately, these three things work together and should echo each other. I think where, where, where companies are coming into uh, friction right now is where they take these three legs of the stool and they treat them as three separate entities, not recognizing that leveraging earned, owned, and paid creates a comprehensive marketing umbrella that we can all lean into. And by the way, it's cross-functional and omni-channel. That means we can all use the good content that we're putting into that funnel, irrespective of the channel that we're putting it out. At my firm, we focus very much on the intersection of these three things. If we can't use it in all three channels, do we really need to do it? Let's invest where we can get the most bang for our buck, as we say, to reinforce those key messages about the company. And that intersection of paid, earned, and owned is really where we get the most utilization of the things that we create. So that's a little bit about the tools and the, and, 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 and the state of play. Let's talk a little bit about how the press works. Let's look at that media relations, that earned piece, and talk a little bit more about how this works. And then that will lead us right into the issues and crisis piece of this. You may be familiar with some of this, and then the only reason I bring this to the fore in this presentation is because I want you to see where we have impact. 
most online and print news works pretty similarly. Similarly, a story is pitched or assigned to a reporter, and then they're tasked with going out and writing that story. And then they do their research before they actually talk to spokespeople. They have a framework for how the story is going to be written or what it's going to be about. They then conduct their interviews. After they do their interviews, they write the story. That story then goes through an editing and a fact checking process to make sure that it's correct. Journalists and publications really want to get it right. And then the headline is written, not by the reporter, and I'll explain why in a moment, which leads to publication. The reason I lay it out this way is because the place that we have the most influence over how the media part of this works are the blue boxes. When you work with a PR firm such as mine, often the story that's assigned or pitched to a reporter is a result of our proactive outreach to that publication or to that reporter to say, hey, would you like to write this story today? I've got a great company that can help you fill in the blanks on that. So we are actually out there helping to cultivate goodwill amongst the reporters and the publications so that our clients get a favorable shake from the reporters and from the pubs. We have a lot of impact in the interview process. We love to pre prepare our spokespeople uh, vigorously for these interviews because ultimately what the reporter takes away from that interview is what's going to shape the way the story comes together. And then in the editing and fact checking process, we can often help to kind of mold that story before it actually goes to publication. Those gray boxes are walled off and very secular to the publications. We don't get to have any impact there. And the reason we point out that the headline's not written by the reporter is because you may already know this, but what drives revenue for publications is clicks. And what the headline writer looks to do is engender as many clicks as possible. So the underlying story may be very academic and straightforward. I can promise you there will be times when the headline will be a little bit more sensational than what follows it. This is in an interest to capture eyeballs and make sure they're clicking on that story. But as you can see, this is a pretty direct roadmap of where we go from the story's inception to the publication and where we can be a part of it. The reporters will tell you very much that what they look to write about is home runs and strikeouts. Mr. Zuckerman has been a friend of our firm for a very, very long time. And he says, look, I know what my readers want. They want news. They want stuff that's driving the market cycle. What you create and what you put out into the market is incredibly important to you and your customers, but it's not only newsworthy. How we connect our product and services to the broader news media, to the stories that are driving the headlines today, that's really what we try to do. In order to get more attention from the media, we need to elevate our products and services and our point of view to match the current news cycle. For financial services, which is an area that we focus on, I will tell you right now, it's the three eyes. Most reporters are asking questions about infrastructure, interest rates, and inflation. Those are three things that are driving the general news cycle, and our clients need to be prepared to answer questions about those in terms of where they sit in that process and how it's affecting their business really needing to understand how we connect ourselves to the news of the day. And the news landscape is changing very dramatically. I, I, I regret to inform you that these newsrooms are shrinking dramatically, which means that the reporters are not often as well informed as they used to be. And so it's incumbent upon us as frequent commentators to help the reporters understand some of the nuance of what we do. We can no longer assume that we get on the phone with the reporter that they're gonna understand immediately what we do and why we matter. Sometimes we need to bring them to that fruition. They're looking for understanding in social media. They're getting story ideas from you and your competitors based on what you post in those channels. So it's so important to make sure that we're filling those channels with good information about us to inspire them. And then what we need to remember is every story that everything on the internet is permanent. I know we remind our children of this every day. The internet doesn't go away. It's the same for the news media as well. Negative stories have a very long shelf life and become part of that search history. I can tell you the best way to prepare to make sure that a negative story does not take an undue toll on your reputation is to have good press already out in front of it. When the algorithms have multiple things to pick from, it's not driving all the, the, the search back to that negative story. There are other things to help uh, saturate that search a little bit more. And then finally, we've said this before, print is going to remain important. I still believe that print publications, even the digital, digital iterations will continue to drive the, the, the current market sentiment. But as you know, broadcast really drives the changing market dynamic on a minute to minute basis. And what's more, video and podcast offerings are growing exponentially. People are curating their own news sources to hear what they need to hear. This is a different, this is a big switch from what we used to be used to. We used to be dictated to by the reporters and the editors and producers about what we can talk about. Now we can choose what to talk about. We can create our own podcasts, our own video offerings that drive our audiences towards what we want them to see. It's really changing the face of the news writ large. 
So what does this mean for navigating the media landscape in 2021? Well, I'll show you some pretty scary things that hopefully I can help demystify a little bit. Wow, look at this. This is the kind of a trust barometer of where all the media that we consume sits. And as you can see, there's a million ways to slice and dice this, but ultimately what we need to be aware of in this is not very, not where people sit on the spectrum, but that there are so many different resources for people to choose from as they're consuming their news and where they fall in terms of trust and reliability and political slant and all the rest of it does matter in the way that they're going to cover you. Now, I'm very fond of telling our, our clients who operate either in China or US businesses with headquarters in China that we need to sometimes separate ourselves a little bit from what's in the headlines. I do believe that for the foreseeable future and even reinforced this week by some of the things that have come out of the Biden White House, we're gonna to continue to see a political saber rattling between these two governments. At the highest levels of government, there is always gonna be some posturing. But what I always remind my clients, both here and in China, is that these two economies are inextricably intertwined. We are going to continue to see the flow of goods and services and fiat currency between these two, two countries for years and years to come without interruption. And so our job as communicators is to find that ground in between the political saber rattling and the flow of currency and find where we can find common ground to talk about what we can contribute to society globally. We are intertwined. And I think we can all say that that's here to stay. How we navigate that on this paradigm of so many outlets is really what's important. In 2021, we've seen so many things that have charged, turbocharged what we're talking about. I mentioned the three eyes, but I've been joking with my clients for the last several months that it's almost journalistic malpractice for, for a journalist not to ask you a COVID question. Maybe not about the origins of COVID, that certainly was part of the conversation, but how it's affecting commerce globally and how we're going to recover and how US-China relations are going to recover from that. We need to make a decision individually amongst our organizations. Do we wanna be a part of those conversations? And we can choose not to be. I think that there is some wisdom in saying, listen, I understand that this is part of the news cycle, but is there any wisdom in me being a participant in those conversations? For some companies, the answer is yes. For some companies, it is incumbent upon them to have, as I like to say, a dog in that hunt. But for other companies, there's a step back. I think that CFIUS regulations, I think intellectual property and data security concerns, these all loom large as we look at the geopolitical landscape, but also the M&A landscape and the collapsing of the global multinationals. Who operates in only one country anymore? Not many of us. And as we look about how we operate as global entities, these things do come up from time to time. What is our stance? How do we lean in? We need to make decisions about how much we want to be immersed in those conversations. Do we want to own them? Do we want to participate in them? Or do we want to avoid them? These are volitional decisions that we need to make for our organizations. Which leads us to issues in crisis management. You know, it takes, uh, I think Warren Buffett would said it takes a hundred years to build a good brand and only one media story to completely tear it down. I think that that's not overstating it. I think we spend so much time thinking about our good name um, amongst our constituencies and then unduly get punished by one negative story. We need to be ready for that. We need to be prepared. I tell folks that we can be much more useful to you as a communications counselor if we're brought in before the barn's on fire. Um, the ability to plan and prepare and be ready to reach uh, our audiences when we need to, it's so crucial and so important. But ultimately, if you're not doing that preparation work ahead of time, working closely with your external legal and financial advisors to make sure that you're ready to face these problems as they arise, you're going to miss the opportunity to be timely in your response. The time to build your crisis and issues management program is not after the sanction has been issued or the insider trading has taken place or the product has been recalled. To anticipate these things ahead of time and be ready with a response, even if it's in skeletal form is so crucial and so timely to make sure that this is a reality when it actually happens. Case study that I like to bring up is our work with the Bank of China. One of our, the folks who have introduced us to the CGCC and a longtime client and a wonderful company that we've had the great, the great fortune of working with for many years. There's a political article published in April of 22 and 2020 talking about how uh, President Trump actively owed the bank tens of millions of dollars we knew this not to be true. We knew this not to be true before the story was published. Um, and as a matter of fact, there was a pass through of, of some transaction, but that, that was no longer on the books with the Bank of China. And very irresponsibly in our estimation, the story ran 
insinuating that we were still part of the transaction and that we still had skin in the game, so to speak. Um, there's a couple of different ways that we could have approached our response to this. We could have just stuck our head in the sand and wait for it to blow over. But in speaking with the senior leaders at the Bank of China, we recognize that the reputational damage that we could sustain in the US as a result of this affiliation could be very detrimental on a go forward basis. So working in tandem with our partners at the Bank of China, we proactively engaged the most senior editors to say, listen, we understand that this is an important story about where Trump's money has been held and continues to be held, but we really want you to get it right. We are owed the duty of care for you to illustrate that we are no longer in the mix on this transaction anymore. And what we were able to do was share filings and data that showed in fact that their reporting was wrong. And in this particular instance, to encourage the editor and the writer of the story to reframe the story in an appropriate way. With the continued pressure continued to mount because we reached out to the other publications who had published the story after the fact and gotten them to retract their stories, it became incumbent upon Politico to then walk their story back and admit they had made a mistake. Now, without the help of a good PR agency, and in this case, uh, we, thankfully, it was our opportunity to help our partners at BOC, we put forth our best foot to not be aggressive or to be defensive, but to basically say to Politico, you have a responsibility to your readers to get it right and work hand in glove with them to get the correction. Now, I have to say, we were very disappointed that the story came out in its original form to begin with, but the outcome was the ability for us to, to really correct the story, go back on the record, get a new piece written that uh, walked back the original piece, and it affected a memo internally at Politico to make sure that the series of errors that they made in that reporting were not gonna be replicated going forward. Working in tandem with your communications partners on the external and the internal team, that's how you affect this change. That's how you can manage these situations. And there's been other instances of crisis and issues management over the past few years that we've worked on and I think are very important. So a, a, a very important one was, you know, the, the, the scourge of gun violence in the US continues to drive headlines on a day-to-day -day basis. Unfortunately, usually because there's been another shooting, but it also extends into the business community as well. One of our clients, TD Bank, um, was a financier, a, a client um, and, and, and financier for Smith & Wesson, one of the biggest ma arms manufacturers in the United States. Um, when they were confronted by the Attorney General of New York about our desire to fund this, ProSec was brought in to help manage the message around how TD Bank was in fact funding this company um, and reminding the press that yes, while Smith & Wesson does in fact make firearms. They're also one of the biggest purveyors of firearms for law enforcement. And that there are some things within that sector of the marketplace that are necessities and that TD Bank was proud to spend with its clients. But more importantly, managing the flow of information to the external audiences to make sure that the things we went on record with were factually based and put the company in the best possible light. You may remember how the US EPA in 2015 issued a, a violation of the Clean Air Act to Volkswagen uh, because they had been um, falsifying their documentation for their emissions data. Um, it took them an incredibly long time to respond. Incredibly long time. For a company of that size, international operations, they really got themselves behind the eight ball because when you don't have something to inject to the conversation, it's almost a tacit information, uh, admission, excuse me, that the EPA was right. Now, in this particular instance, they were. But for Volkswagen to, to walk, first deny that it was the case and then to have to walk back that denial weeks after the fact, did nothing for their reputation. Now they've spent a lot of time in the ensuing years rebuilding that reputation. I think you could, one could say that they've done a fairly good job of it. But in the early stages of this crisis, for a company of this size with the storied history they had to A, double down on the error and then B, remain silent for the, for the, for the response was definitely a bad corporate PR move. And then who can forget Cambridge Analytica, um, the political data firm, which uh, got access to 50 million Facebook uh, political users and, and uh, 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 allegedly used that to help Donald Trump uh, run targeted ads on Facebook. Again, the Facebook team took such a long time. And again, in the headlines again yesterday with the downtime with Facebook, we saw probably uh, for every 10 articles that ran about the Facebook outage, we saw one article that asked, where is senior management's comments on this? Why are they not coming out to comfort and to assure their users and their partners that this is under control? Again, when you fail to control the message, you become part of the story. And while everybody was opining as to what went wrong, stories started to be written about absentee management and how they weren't coming forward. Now, they corrected it later in the day with a series of statements, but I cannot stress enough 
to everybody on this call today, in the absence of good information that the press can respond to, they will fill that vacuum for you. Even if all you can do to come forward is to say, we are aware of the situation, of course, it's very serious. We'll provide you with an update when we have one. But in the absence of any response at all, the press will waste no time in creating that narrative around the situation for you. I will stop there, and I'm very appreciative of the time and attention that you've given to my remarks. I wanted to leave ample time at the, at the back end of this for your questions. Um, I hope I've given you a good framework of what the difference between PR and marketing is, the different types of tools that we can use, and really given you a little bit of a framework for those who, of you who may not have been familiar with some of this stuff. But I'm really happy now, and I always love to entertain questions for the audience to drill down or give you more specific examples or answer any questions that you might have. So with that, I'll turn it back over to Abby to help navigate the Q&A session. Thank you, Tom, for, for that insightful presentation. Um, it's great to learn some critical you know, concepts in PR and in marketing um, to understand how the press and media work. Also, it's very um, valuable to, to know that companies, especially um, Chinese companies, probably should take a strategic and a proactive approach to tell their stories, share their industry opinions, and make that presence in the market. So um, thank you. Um, I'm sure our audience has learned a lot and the questions will start, will start to you know, piling up. So um, I have the first one that uh, it goes to like a general. I've seen many Chinese CEOs are reluctant to actively um, speak to the Western media because they want to uh, control the narrative. Mm -hmm. So what advice would you give for them in terms of how to get attention from the local Western news or to reassure them that there will be um, both negative and positive pieces? Such a wonderful question and one that we struggle with, not just with uh, Chinese CEOs, but, but global CEOs. This will not surprise you. Um, there are cultural um, uh, aspects at play here that make it difficult sometimes to convince uh, some officials and companies to engage with the media. They feel that they're either being treated unfairly or will, because of where the company is headquartered, might not get the, the similar respect that they deserve. I can't argue with that. What I will say is I think there is a learning process. This is not a binary situation. It is not, we either need to participate with the media or we don't. And I do think that there are ways to very um, delicately and surgically get your CEOs to understand that yes, there will be some negative and positive pieces, but to not participate is to lose. I'm very forceful about this when we speak to our executives. Again, you cannot always stop a negative story from happening, but I promise you, if you don't participate in the media, those stories are gonna come out anyway and without your comments. And I always counsel our clients that it is sometimes better if a negative story is going to be written to at least have your statement within it. So at least you can say, look, we tried. We tried to get the reporter to understand our point of view. In the absence of that, you're letting them drive the narrative. I recognize that for some of our communications professionals on that call, you're probably nodding along and shaking your head all at the same time. I know you've had these conversations with your executives. What I would say is take heart. I, again, this is, this is a marathon, not a sprint. Sometimes getting them to do a low risk, high reward type of piece with a friendly reporter acclimate them to Western journalists, help them understand that not every journalist is out to get them, give them the opportunity to interface in a safe zone before we kind of expand and get to the more, you know, higher, perhaps higher risk sort of opportunities in top tier media. But I can promise you, the less we participate, the more that that narrative is going to be spelled out for us. And I think that's a very dangerous road to travel. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Um, um, there is uh, one question that goes back to one of your slides, uh, actually. Sure. Uh, yeah, an audience named Joe Wan asked, could you please further talk about the landscape of the news outlets of the U.S.? That the yeah. slides with all yeah, the logos that's on very, it. That's a very busy <laughs> slide. That's an, that's an annual study. I know it's very hard to read. Uh, if you could put the slide back up. So um, this is very hard to leave. You can see that um, we, we this is a, a study that's published on an annual basis that really measures publications in terms of their reliability and their political slant. And I think what's interesting about this is like, like any good continuum, there's a pretty good bell curve here. Um, you will see that, you know, there, there seem to be 
Um, there's some real outliers, like we think about the National Enquirer, which is, of course, just a sensationalist publication. But as we look at the more right-leaning, less reliable publications on either side of the, of the spectrum, there seems to be pretty equal balance between left and right. I think the point that this slide is trying to indicate is at the top of that bell curve, you're some of your more trusted, um, your, your trusted media outlets like the AP, like NPR, um, they, they try to hit it down the middle. And what we tell our clients all the time is in that top box is this, this idea of reliability and neutral bias. That's where you're going to find the reporters are more willing to do a better job of the information you share with them. Um, Fox News, I think we can all agree, will be a little bit more rightly. The MSNBC certainly needs more to the left. The, what's interesting about the United States media landscape is that everything is politically charged. And that's only gotten worse over the last five to six years. Personally, as a practitioner of communications, I find this to be very troublesome because we can no longer pitch a story just on its merits. It's instantly put through that red or blue filter here in the US, irrespective of what it is. I, I, I often joke with my wife, why do we vote for Democrats or Republicans for town councils? Potholes aren't partisan. And yet, as you're bringing your products and services to market, and because there may be affiliation with the Chinese government, it's instantly put through that political filter. What we can do is work very hard to make it more about the thing, what value we're bringing to the landscape, how we're integrating ourselves into the marketplaces. It's a challenge and it's not an easily solved one. I do believe that building rapport with reporters to say, hey, we know about the political climate, we know about the economic climate, we'd like to talk about this middle section, Seeking them out and giving them good information, building that reputation with them is the first step into making those connections. But when you're talking about splitting the uprights, as we say in American football, you see that green box at the top. Those are the publications that generally look to try and make it less polarized and try to report the news. Um, we think that's where you should focus most of your attention. Thank you. That's very uh, good advice. Yes. Um, Tom, you said that um, um, for companies, um, the, the best solution to, you know, to deal with the bad reputation is to put the good reputation out there sure. um, in front. So I, I have a question that's uh, an audience from a Chinese company, I guess. So yes. Uh, the question goes, as a Chinese company operating in the U.S., how mm -hmm. can we build good media relationship with journalists who are willing to listen and engage without an ulterior motive or agenda. Thank you. Very carefully. And I, and I only say that half joking. Um, it, is, it, is, it is a painstaking process. Um, I, I believe inherently that most journalists want to get it right. I believe that. I do believe that they have a responsibility to do fair and balanced reporting. Um, and and this, is, this doesn't just go for Chinese companies, this goes for companies around the world. Um, human rights and ESG are really kind of governing a lot of what we're hearing in the general, in the general press right now. They're expected to ask those questions. Um, when it comes to, the, to, to, to human, uh, alleged human rights violations or environmental protections or things of that nature, we can expect that good journalists who don't have an agenda will still ask those questions. We need to build our responses to those questions before we get them. We need to anticipate that the reporters are going to ask those questions. It is naive for us to think that we're going to walk into a room or get on the phone with a reporter and they're only going to ask us the questions that we want to answer, right? I also want to impress upon you that just because a reporter asks you a question does not mean you need to answer it. And what do I mean by that? When we do our media training, and I train a lot of our executives to interface with the media, we teach them a lot of tips and techniques about how to elevate the question into safer zones to help not really get right at the heart of the matter, but to talk about things in a more general way. Um, some reporters are tenacious and they'll continue to ask the question, hoping to elicit a response. But as I tell everybody that I train, there is no legally binding measure that says you have to give a reporter a direct answer to a direct question. And really working with your communications team or your outside communications council to say, we can't anticipate we're gonna get asked this question. How do we frame a good answer around it? How can we be honest and direct without being evasive? Um, for each question, for each set of, of hot button issues, there's gonna be a different process to that. But I will tell you, if the first time you're considering how to answer is after the reporters ask the question, you've waited too long. Work with your teams, know you're going to get those questions, anticipate that you're gonna to need to give them something um, and try to find a common safe ground to share that. And again, I won't get into the many different issues and, and, and different scenarios that could come across, but we're all familiar with them. Um, but just know you're going to get those questions and to pretend otherwise, I think is to be a little bit naive. 
Thank you, Tom. Um, I also have a, a couple of questions. Um, it seems the audience is um, very uh, um, um, interested in the, in the CRES and uh, um, uh, crisis management. So sure. there is one question that um, goes, in a crisis, what is the right time to engage with the medium? And mm -hmm. another one similar to this one is, in what types of situations should you put out a formal statement? Sure. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll answer the first question with a joke before it happens. <laughs> I mean, honestly, it, and, and, and I, I'm only half kidding when I say that. I think um, when we plan, we like to, I'm, I'm actually traveling. This background you see behind me is I'm actually in a hotel room because tomorrow I'm running tabletop exercises. I'm doing crisis tabletop exercises with one of my clients in anticipation of things that might happen. I think that building up some muscle memory to anticipate those things teaches us how to respond. So when is the right time to communicate with, an, with, with the media about something that's gone wrong? As soon as you can. As soon as you can cogently share with them, we are aware this has happened, we are addressing the situation. Maybe you have a remediation and maybe you don't, but do not let the media come to you and say, we know this is broken and what are you doing about it? Because now you've already lost control of the story. I tell folks it is uncomfortable, so uncomfortable to have to go out in front of the media and say, we broke that. But when you are the ones who are telling them that you broke it, there's almost a deference to then giving you the opportunity to provide the additional information. If the media comes to you and says, why did you break that? You're answering a different set of questions. So the answer to that question is as quickly as you can, as authoritatively as you can, and then manage their expectations about when they might get an update. I think something that was lost in the shuffle yesterday is Facebook went down and we had about a 90 minutes of social media interaction between ourselves before Facebook actually said, hey, we're aware this is happening. And in that 90 minutes, the ru I, I saw rumors yesterday that they had SWAT teams kicking in the door of the cage to get to the servers. None of that was true. But because there wasn't an official statement from the company that was having a problem, everything, all the rumor, all the innuendo became lore, became fact before we actually knew what was happening again. Own it as soon as you can. And when is it okay to put out a statement or when you should put out a statement? Again, it really depends on how much reputation you need to manage. There are certain things that don't need, you know, and people say to me, oh, key, key person risk. You know, we've lost the senior executive, not for any nefarious reasons, but just because they're retiring or moving on, own that narrative. Own that narrative. If, you, if somebody retires or leaves the company and they're a senior person and you don't tell the media, their knee-jerk reaction is they were forced out, they were asked to leave, or they were fired because they did something wrong. That's an easy one. If we have a senior leader who's been with the firm for a long time and is going to go retire to spend more time with their family or their grandchildren or pursue their passion for travel, there's no harm in telling the marketplace about that. Oh, and by the way, here is their successor who's gonna do an equally wonderful job. Those are missed opportunities to manage stories that really aren't stories. But if something is really broken, if there's really a crisis, again, I think putting out a statement as quickly as possible to say, at least we acknowledge that this is happening and we're gonna get you more information as soon as we can. So crucial to say, we are a good actor. We are a good participant in this market. We are here to share information and we'll sort out who's at fault later on, but we just want you to know we're in front of this. So I think sooner rather than later, um, and a formal statement often a very important and, uh, way to do that. Got you, Tom, as, as quickly as possible and take that advantage as much as you can, right? <laughs> Absolutely, it, it, it shifts very, very quickly. Thank you. Um, okay, I also have a couple of questions about uh, communication agencies Steve, that you are in sure. the perfect position to answer. So how much communication can be handled internally versus hiring an external agency? And also sure. one um, um, that goes to that, I understand it's always nice to have an external agency to handle communication, but for, but for a smaller company that has to do it by, by itself, what are the suggestions for you know, crisis, crisis management. You can sure. answer them separately. Yeah. Uh, let's take the second one first. Uh, to, to our small, to our smaller company players, welcome. Um, and 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 when you have a team of two, it seems like every day is a crisis. And we understand that. I would say there's a couple of different ways to handle that. I would say, listen, firms like like mine, um, we're happy to partner with companies um, to be your issues or crisis management council when you need us. But again, it's, it's, it's preparing for that ahead of time. It's saying, 
you know, we may not need you on a day-to-day -day basis. We don't have the bandwidth or the budget to execute a full media relations strategy on a monthly basis, but we'd like to know that you're there, just like you have an accountant or just like you have a lawyer to help you navigate legal or financial um, uh, matters. You know, it's nice to know that there's somebody, you know, break glass in case of emergency, we can call on the ProSec team or your provider of choice to say, we can't handle this on our own and we need to bring in some experts to help us. So I would counsel smaller companies. You may think it's expensive, but I also would mind you, the, the, the danger of not having somebody to rely on is probably more expensive in the long run. So again, it's an old adage, but that ounce of prevention being worth a pound of cure. Um, and again, we can be very flexible. And I know other agencies are as well um, to say, I don't need to charge you until you need us, but let's put some frameworks in place. And I hope you never call. I have a whole list of clients that are on my responsibility list that they never call me because they only need me in crisis and not good. They haven't had a crisis recently, that's okay. Um, but I do think that building up some frameworks, having a crisis guidebook, doing those tabletop exercises, kicking the tires to be prepared, and then hopefully you'll never need us. But that's one way that smaller companies can say, if it ever goes south, I have a resource to call upon. And I'm sorry, Abby, can you remind me of the first question again so I can make sure I address it? Oh, yeah. The, the first one goes, how much communications can be handled internally um, uh, hiring an external agency? Yes, uh, that that runs the gamut. Um, I... I, we have certain, I think for us, um, one, of the, one of the types of companies that I love to work with the most are mid-sized companies where they actually say, look, we're owner operators. We've got some heft and some resource, but we don't have marketing and we don't have PR. And so we, we kind of come in and fill that role for them as an outside operator. Um, sometimes we graduate our clients, we grow with them over time and then they'll hire a chief marketing officer mm -hmm. or a chief risk officer, right? Um, it really depends on the size of the organization. For some of our bigger clients, they already have 25, 30 people in PR and they bring us in just to be an extension of that team. So it's a really not a really good answer to your question, but I would say look at your organization and your risk profile, especially when it comes to issues in crisis. Do I think that every organization needs some sort of risk communications risk manager? I do not. But I do think that any marketing people or PR people that you have within the organization should be cross-trained to be the first line of attack or defense against those crises. They should be at least able to catch the football before they pass it off to somebody else. They should be trained in how to intake the negativity and say, okay, this now exceeds my bandwidth or my capability. I need to bring in other partners. Now, for some of our clients, we're already there as their PR partner, so we can elevate to their crisis partner, as in that example I showed you with Bank of China. And for others, as I said, we're just on speed dial when they need us. But I do think for each organization, measure your risk sensitivity. How often do you think a crisis will be present? And then build around that. Anticipate so you can react. Don't just react. Okay, thank you, Tom. Um, I'm happy to see our audience are actively engaging with us. So and I'm happy to answer them as long as we have. These are great questions, guys. And I'm so <laughs> happy to answer as many as we can in the time we've got. Sure. Uh, so as a follow-up on crisis uh, management, there is also a common uh, thought that we should wait until the storm is gone. You know, don't engage to yes. escalate the situation. So what's your comment on that? Not anymore. I mean, I, I think that there was some conventional wisdom, you know, maybe 10 or 15 years ago that um, let's see how bad it is before. The media moves too fast. Twitter moves too fast. LinkedIn moves too fast. In the, and again, I've said it three times and I'll say it again, in the absence of a formal comment from the company, everyone will rush to fill that vacuum. And once they do, now you have two crises. You have the one that you're managing and you have the communications mess that you have to untangle, reprogram, and then get the message out. They will not wait for you. They won't. And who's the they? It is the media. It is your customers. It is your competitors who love to see blood in the water. I've seen instances where companies have hit rocky shores and the first comment comes to their competitors and look at how broken they are. Shouldn't you move your business to us, mm -hmm. right? Now you may say, well, that's dirty pool or unfair. Unfortunately, that's business. And in the absence of your ability to say, hey, this is broken, we're gonna fix it, stand tall with us. You're gonna find people willing to take those clients away or infer what's happening. I, I, I think the time for waiting and seeing is long past. Um, does it mean you need to be out there in front of them 24 seven giving them updates? It does not. Yeah. 
incremental communications, helping people to understand. BP faced this back during the, the Gulf Water Horizon spill. You remember in the Gulf of Mexico, their incremental responses were terrible. A wonderful company with a long storied history of actually managing crises well, but the way that they incrementally gave updates to the marketplace when other information was available, what they ended up doing was not telling their story. They ended up reacting to the other data that people were gathering. That's never a good place to be. Mm. Instead of owning that data and sharing it proactively with the media, they were constantly asking questions about what other people had uncovered. Now you're on your back foot. Right. So again, a long answer to a short question. The time for waiting and seeing has passed. We need to own these things right out of the chute, or you're going to spend a lot of time untangling the messaging. We hear you. Thank you, Tom. Um, so, um, so for a lot of companies, there are um, many agencies on the market. It's sometimes hard for them to to find the right one. So I have a question. Like, what do you think is the most important factor that makes a PR agency stand out among others? Since there are, you know, there are so many in, in the U.S. market. Just so. so I'm glad you asked that question, and I, I will try not to. I'll try not to make this a commercial, but I will tell you from my own experience. I've been with ProSec for 17 years. Um, I'll tell you what I think stands apart. It's competency competency. I think, I think that the, the actual aspects of PR, raising visibility, they're not that complicated. It's understanding your clients, component industries, and the value they provide that ecosystem. When I talk about how we promote our clients, when I talk about, I'll use BOC as an example, a longstanding client, a wonderful relationship. They've been such a great partner over the years. We don't just talk about what BOC does. We talk about where BOC is. We talk about where BOC can provide comment and affect the conversations that are having at the regulatory level, right? It's not just about what you're putting out there. It's the ability of your agency to say, not only do I understand you, but I understand your place in the market and your place in the world. And how do we thread those needles on a daily basis to make sure that you're getting the good news out there. What, a follow-up question that I see around Joe's question is how do you make the good news travel fast? Have something good to say, right? You cannot wait for the reporter to come to you and say, like, hey, company, tell me something good about you today. That's never gonna happen. It is tenacity. It is being out there in front of them. It's constantly looking for those opportunities to, to say to the reporter, you need to talk to my client today because this is the news cycle and they're experts on that. It is proactive, not reactive. So Joe, getting back to your question, number one is competency. Do they know your business and know it well? Do they know the reporters in your space? Can they interface with them? Can they take what you do and not talk about all of it, but just the things that need to be talked about today? life and more important than anything, do you have chemistry with them? I think we forget sometimes that when we talk to reporters, we're talking to human beings, right? They're just looking to write a good story so they can get paid, so they can take care of their families too, right? That's really what this is about. And I think your agency needs to have good chemistry with your company so that you like working with them. It's no fun to work with a partner that either doesn't get you or doesn't seem interested in you. And if we can give you good interface with the reporters and we feel comfortable working with you, it all starts to work together. Test the chemistry. I think that RFPs are great. I think that pitches and ideas are great. Meet the team. These are the people you're going to be, these are the people you're going to send out into war on behalf of your brand. You should like them and trust them. Test that. I think that that's really the hallmark of a good agency. But good news traveling fast, you, again, on that follow-up question, guys, good news does not travel fast. You need to make the good news travel. That is the hard and fast rule. Nobody is going to write nice things about you just because they woke up this morning and decided to do so. They've got to be pitched the story. You've got to keep on them. You've got to reinforce to these reporters over a period of months and years that you matter. And then they will start writing good stuff about you. That's it. The bad news, that's out there in a heartbeat. Everybody loves tragedy. The good news, you got to work a lot harder to make that part of the cycle. Thank you, Tom. Um, I have one uh, very practical question about, sure. uh, yeah, um, somebody asked uh, if some media wrote about forced news, like forced information about my company. So yes. how do I respond? Would a lawyer's letter work? No, I, I think that getting the lawyers involved immediately is usually a little defensive. Um, look, <laughs> if it's patently false, for instance, uh, the example I used in, in, in the presentation about BOC, we knew that was demonstrably false. The, the, what they printed was factually inaccurate. That transaction no longer resided 
on Bank of China's balance sheet, therefore the report was erroneous. That's an easy one. Getting the correction is not easy, but being able to go to the reporter and be like, wrong, false, here's the data that shows it. That you said it was 25, I have data that says it's 26, you need to fix this. Those are the easy ones. False news or fake news or uh, shades of gray, Miko, I think, you know, is it false or do we just not like it? Is it wrong or is it interpretation of the facts that we don't really have anything to say? Again, if it's demonstrably false, if they have taken bad information and published it and we can data from a data-driven perspective say, this is actually wrong. That's the easy part. It's those shades of gray. It's, and again, we talked about before, filling the vacuum. Most of the time when we see false news, it's because we refuse to comment didn't go on the record, didn't try to get the right information. And they're drawing an inference from what they know. And unless we can actually say to them, that is actually factually inaccurate. Now it's a bad story that we don't like because we're not a part of. So again, a long answer to a short question. The only time you get lawyers involved is when they've actually libeled you. They have printed something damaging to the brand that is demonstrably false and you have a case. But writing a, getting a lawyer to write a letter and said, we didn't like your story because it made us look bad and that falseness is just the negativity, I think that that's a bad, and again, how do you prevent those bad stories from being written? Build relationships with reporters ahead of time. So when it comes time for them to include you in the story, you already have some capital to spend with them to get a better story written. Again, Nico, it's a marathon, not a sprint. You gotta start early and build those relationships over time. Um, I think Chinese companies are starting to see the light here in the Western media. This goes for uh, Europe and for the US. You're starting to recognize that if I can get in with these reporters early, if I can start to share good information with them early, not even necessarily about me, but about the market, I become a trusted resource. They're gonna treat me a little bit more fairly. I think that that's where it starts. Okay, great, great. Thank you, Tom. I hope we could keep this conversation going, but um, as the time is tight, let's uh, accommodate one more question. One last sure. question. So this one is about social media. So yes, with yes. social media like Twitter, um, is it better to not be on it at all to avoid mm -hmm. being pulled into negative scenarios or how to yeah. you know, navigate you know, the dynamics there? A wonderful final question. And I will leave you with this. I, I think that they're unavoidable. Here's the, the difficulty with, with, with some of the social media platforms. They, they have a life of their own anymore, right? And I believe that market participants need to look long and hard at these different modalities and say, what is appropriate? Again, it's not binary. It's not all Twitter or no Twitter. There are degrees of participation in Twitter, but I think reputable companies, global companies, global brands are participating in these platforms because it travels so fast. It's a great equalizer. We have the opportunity to get news out there as quickly as we want because we have access to these platforms. Yes, we also have the, the difficulty of managing the information that flows in on them. But I'll tell you, most of our companies, and again, I work for some companies that have been in existence for 200 and 300 years. Some of our asset management clients have been along for, for, around for a really long time, right? They're even starting to see the utility of it. When we can control the narrative on our terms, even when those little pockets of negativity pop up, we've already built in an audience. We've already got champions. We've already got cheerleaders. It's amazing when you see people start to denigrate a brand, how that baked in audience comes to their defense. You don't need to mobilize them, they mobilize on their own. And it's not to say that everything is a flag waving flag on the ground. What I am saying is that to ignore those channels is to ignore them at your peril, because those conversations are gonna carry on about your brand, whether you're participating or not. And I think that that's the key there, how much, how little, that's up to each individual organization, but I do not believe that you can ignore the digital channels anymore. You need to be a participant to be taken seriously as a corporate communicator. All right. Thank you again, Tom, and, and, and the Prozac team for sharing your insights and experience with the group. Well, well, I, I hope the perspective and knowledge you shared today will be useful and beneficial to our member companies and attendance. I'm sure of that. Yes. So thank you again, Tom. Well, lastly, before we call it a, call it a day, there are uh, a few announcements we, we do want to, uh, to make here. So CGCC will be hosting these um, exciting events in October. On the 13th, we will have several Chinese companies to share their experiences and the stories on um, operating in the US. This event will be in Chinese. 
Oh, the next day on the 14th, we will host an event taking, uh, talking about what if I got a subpoena, the key strategies and considerations for Chinese companies to prepare for and respond to you as a subpoena. So please feel free to scan the QR code on the screen to RSVP. And next, we are very excited to announce that the CGCC 2022 Lunar New Year of the Tiger Gala is returning to an in-person celebration on January the 19th, 2022 at Cibriani 42 2nd Street in New York City. Well, the gala will celebrate the resilience of our, of our businesses and the communities and show appreciation to impactful leaders as we reflect on the challenges of the past year and anticipate a positive rebound in the months to come. So please save the date, mark your calendar, and join hundreds of friends in being part of this landmark gathering and support us to reach, inspire, and activate our community. So for, so for uh, more information regarding gala sponsorship and partnership opportunities, feel free to contact us anytime. Please also visit our website, follow us on social media, and subscribe to our daily newsletter to connect with CGCC. We'd also uh, love to hear uh, from you, so please make sure to fill out the short survey uh, that will pop up when you log out. Thank you all again, and we look forward to seeing you at our upcoming events. Thank you again, Tom.